two, one. We're recording there, which means we're recording here. Freddie Camp, welcome to the H Hour Studio. Thank you very much indeed. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Um, right, so MFS casting, which mm. we're going to get into. Yeah. However, we obviously have a, a keen, a keen interest of in, uh, professional and maybe personal in TV and film. What do you make of the whole Russell Brand saga going on? Uh, oh, ek. Um, <laughs> views expressed of my own, um, etc. <laughs> um, not being all that fond of him as a person and a brand, etc. Um, but I also am cynical enough to know that people can make accusations that may be based on truth, may not be. So I'm, I'm kind of like, do you know what? You guys just mess about whatever um what will what will be true will be true and i will keep a, an active eye on it but i'm also honestly um yeah could he have done it he may well have done it may he well not have done also also true and so therefore as a result i'm kind of watching f- with a a half an eye on it to see whether it transpires that he was true i mean kevin spacey Okay, you know, people will make accusations all the time about people in the public eye. Um, so I'm I'm reserving judgment as to whether it was a legitimate claim or not. You fanny. <laughs> uh, did you see? Did you? See, I didn't mean that. I'm only joking. I, <laughs> I it's a, it's a very yes. I. I can understand uh, her wanting to show carefully on it. It's a t- t- dodgy subject. Especially, well, especially if you end up sounding like you're defending him mm-hmm. and he turns out to be guilty. But at the moment, a lot of people are, um, a lot of people are, sound like they're defending him, but they're not. They're actually attacking the way the situation's been handled. Yeah. Uh, whether he's, whether he's guilty, guilty or not. Or not. Yeah. You know, you look at who is the, who is it in Westminster, in the government, who has written to Rumble and Instagram and YouTube and all that? Who is that lady who's done that and I said, hey, you better not be letting him make money from his videos? Right. Which is pretty shocking to do that. Yeah. Pretty shocking. Because that... Well, so she's presuming that he's guilty. Well, he's supposed to be innocent. He's been guilty. And she's trying to remove, get pressure on them into removing his revenue. That is pretty shocking, to be yeah. honest. And it reminds me of the the whole Twitter file saga. It's exactly what the US government were doing on a massive scale. Huge. Um, massive scale with Twitter and with Facebook for not just people, like not just well-known personalities, mm-hmm. but Joe Bloggs, yeah. who said something against the narrative or talked about things that they didn't want talked about in run-ups to elections and that's kind of what she did but she's done it in broad daylight written a letter on letter just what are you doing what are you doing who is that lady actually reference that? earlier comment yeah westminster honestly oh, on the icebreaker yeah 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 yeah. who is it um well oh, i can't remember her name i can't remember her name yeah but that's pretty shocking because if he you know if he turns out to be innocent um then what she's what the government's played a part in is wrongfully what's well, wrongfully the way you look at it at this stage when he's not being convicted is wrongfully removing his uh his in, right in, to in, earn in a, a living yeah that's right exactly you know uh i was talking about this on a, another podcast i do called the horizon scan right. a guy called gaz walsh sin eaters guild yes yeah yeah, so, yeah yeah and it's a weekly thing we we talk about current events and we talk about this and we were talking about K- Kevin Spacey. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the example of Kevin Spacey, Kevin Spacey got cancelled from everything. Yeah. N- knee- knee-jerk reaction from, from everybody. Cancelled from everything. Literally, the you know, sort of the peak of cancel culture and he got the brunt of it. And then, recently, c- uh, totally cleared yeah. in the UK courts yeah. of, to- like, presumed totally innocent. Yeah. Still impacted his 
life in a big way yeah. wrongfully so yeah. impacted his mental health in a big way he 100 yeah. percent. you know he's, he's lost hundreds of thousands if not millions in potential Revenue gigs that he could gigs, have had yeah, exactly. you know and, and uh that's that's the danger with with this situation now not that i'm saying russell brand is guilty or innocent i don't know yeah no one does yeah. so to try and destroy someone's you know like like that at the moment i mean if you look at even with things like police or or just Joe blogs. If you get, you know, if you if you going if you get arrested and you're going through like a trial process or whatever, I, I find it hard to believe that you get sacked for that until until the the result was in. You'd you'd like to think so in a in a perfect world. I don't know if that's necessarily always true. Um, you know, people, I, I think, put an awful lot of. Uh, pressure on on public image and association with if someone is charged on admittedly maybe a very very serious charge then an association of that they i think they automatically presume that the association is damaging regardless of whether that has been proven guilty or or not and i, I think that's really quite harmful yes i think about the military actually because you can be you can be binned at the military for bringing the army disrepute bringing the army to disrepute right and I'm, I'm trying to think of what the case was oh i tell you what it was it was the the lady on camp in colchester the lady repeatedly on camp in Col right. repeatedly on camp in colchester and there was videos of um videos of of her enjoying herself with a lot a lot of men on the camp and got videoed couple of videos and they got released and i in fact was that the one yeah and i'm pretty sure a bunch of them got booted out i think fails I the think, service test doesn't it for bringing this uh, bringing the army in disrepute mm -hmm. now, did they or did the person who recorded it on video <laughs> you know because we're not talking about rape or anything here we're talking about consensual Albeit unusual situation, but um, yeah, so I'm not saying it was okay either. By the way, no, but uh, <laughs> I mean, the fucking idiots, just fucking idiots. So what? What? Why would you? Why would you? I, I why would you take the risk? Quite so, of STDs and yeah. all the rest of it. And Indeed. the thing is, this day and age, it is guaranteed going to be videoed. Of course, videos and everything. I yeah. would be, I'd be running a mile from that block if it's me. If I get what? Yeah, yeah. Who's in the block? As soon as someone has one of these. How many people are involved? I am gone. Yeah. Get me away from you yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get sure. me away from you now. Um, I apprehended someone in Cambridge uh, a few years ago. Um, what do you mean apprehended? Apprehended. So I was I was in Cambridge for work, and I had like a, a, a Daunt Books tote bag with all my stuff in it. And I was coming around the corner, minding my own business, and someone comes out of TK Maxx in a hurry. Grab, uh, jumps on uh, the Cambridge equivalent of a, of, a, of the Boris bike, so yellow hire bike out that was propped outside the door, and had multiple uh, handbags on his arm, and he foolishly decided to cycle within arm's reach of me, <laughs> and I decided to stop him. I, you know, it's like he said, "You're right, mate." I'm like, "No, you're coming off." And I literally just pulled him off the bike three times. On the third occasion, he fell off and smashed his head on a, um, a local burger van rear light cluster. So he had a bit of a head injury that was bleeding. Um, what do you mean three times? He got back on the bike? He got back on the bike twice to, to try and get away. And I just kept pulling him off. And eventually he fell over and I then just s sat on them. Um, and, you know, members of the public were out grabbing hold of me going, leave the guy alone. I'm like, literally, I'm not the guy who needs to be stopped. Get a hold of the police. This is the this is the dude, uh, and so uh, he was he was yabbing away, giving me all sorts of abuse. The, the air was black with his language, which was wonderful. Um, and I was I managed to uh, attract a crowd of onlookers, but everybody going back to the cameras, everybody was recording it, everybody. And I was like, "Do you have to? You know, I don't know necessarily that he's done it at the moment. He is innocent. He has a right to privacy too." And they're like, "You can't make us stop recording." I'm like. Knock yourself out. Whatever. Whatever. Um, it's then, weird, isn't it? Yeah. People, people do that thinking they're helping. Yeah. As opposed to actually helping. You know, I, I don't mean in that situation, but in like a, 
RTA. You, know, you spoke about an RTA incident on the on the icebreaker before this, like RTA or whatever, or someone struggling, like a, someone's been like a copper being overcome by other people or something like that going on, and they will film it like they're helping, like it's a good thing. Now that that may help retrospectively yeah, in a court. You, you You're not know. helping now. Yeah, you put your phone down and actively get involved. Yeah, you know. Yeah. It it was helpful to to transpire off of the fact that uh, of the uh, onlookers, I had a a, a, um, a trauma medic, a, an actual doctor who I was in contact with for for their um, eyewitness statements, so I could understand from obviously when you're involved in that kind of situation, you're very very focused on the person in front of you. You not really don't have that much situational awareness of what else is going on, and they're like, no, because he was talking. Yes, you look, you checked his head for for, for bleeding, but yeah. Uh, so you showed the due concern that this guy, yeah, sure, he had had a head injury, but the amount of abuse he was giving you, and you could see and engaging with you, you were fine. You did everything right. I was like, thank God for that. What's, the, what's the law on uh, on apprehending someone like that? So he used violence to apprehend someone who was shoplifting. Um, that's a very good question. I don't. I don't <laughs> honestly know. Um, you know, I, I literally responded in that moment again without without thought. The guy was coming away from a shop with things that were clearly handbags in a rush, cycling past me. I just decided to stop him. Don't know where that came from. Could I, could I have, in retrospect, just let the guy go and just carry on with my day? Maybe. I mean, I certainly didn't thump the guy. I just pulled him off his bike. I mean, the, the police did arrive eventually, about half an hour later, give or take. But uh, a lot of the reason you get the dramas in 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 the towns and cities these days, a, a, a lot of the dramas that people like take into complete piss like that, is because they can get away with it more than they used to. Because people are less willing to intervene yeah. because of things like phones and internet. Yeah, because you could be painted in completely the wrong light, because the worst light ever. If you look at the, you've got the recent incident in peckham is it was it in peckham in mm -hmm. london i think it was with the asian shopkeeper and the a, a black lady who and so there was like a couple of stills released and maybe a sh and there's a short video really the ones that were focused on in the media and they showed the asian shopkeeper was a man as well and the black and there was a black lady and he was a lot bigger than her as well and it, when you look at those, it just looks like he's either A, strangling her, or B, just, like, being violent for no apparent reason. Yeah? When he watched the full footage, so they got released, uh, his, uh, those got released, his, sh his shop was shut down, he shut it, sh it couldn't open it up, because the abuse written all over the, because obviously he shuts, has shut us down every night, opens it back up, we're just talking like a corner shop kind of place. And, uh, and it shut down because the abuse, like it was, it was the Black Lives Matter and racism and all of this stuff all over it, um, and uh, he couldn't open back up. When you watch the full the full video clips, there's a bunch of different cameras in there as well. When you watch them, she was a nutter. Like she was in this shoplifting and she was battering him. She was battering him repeatedly, and he was doing nothing. So she was hitting him. You can't tell what it is on there, but she's hitting him with the thing. He's 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 ducking away, he's trying to shield himself, and he's, you can see the restraint. And this woman's battering him. He's obviously saying, you can't do that. You can't just take the stuff. And she batters him in several different parts of the store. And the one clip, and the one still, and the clip is seconds. And the one or two stills they released look like he is being a complete bastard. And com it completely misrepresents him. And that's why people don't want to get involved. Because you can, you, like, that incident where you were involved in, someone wants to release the wrong clip with the wrong, the, the wrong, the wrong still, the wrong part of the video, or any part of the video, with some bullshit story about it. This guy attacked this bloke for no other reason than he bumped into him on his bike, or you know something like that. You in the shit, you're getting cancelled, <laughs> you know, for no for no apparent reason other than doing good, or what he thought was doing good at the time. It, it, yeah, um, it it. It beggars belief that that's kind of where we've got to. It really does. There's no way around it. There's no way around I it. I mean, do you, do you, I, I think you should still act if that is what you feel is the right thing to do. Okay, so you can get into yeah you know, a bit of a minefield on this. You know, 
under circumstances where there's it's really hard to plan and yet you see something happening and you are compelled to act somehow um given backstory given current events um i remember a docudrama based on british army in bosnia etc that whole campaign i think damien lewis was uh one of the the light or armored infantry tank commanders i forget exactly what the story was but i remember this this uh again uh how much this is artistic license i don't even know but the number of times over the net a set of orders would come and he was on the ground and saying this is you no know, we're here as peacekeepers but in, in front of us something atrocious is happening and i have to i have to intervene he seeks clarification and just decides actually sorry can't hear you no and and again whether that was true or not i don't know only the people on the ground will know but under those circumstances where your very being is like i have to do something and not to hell with consequences but this needs an intervention somehow what do you do do you are you impotent for fear of repercussions or do you act anyway because it is the right thing to do you may not have an idea of the bigger picture of course not how on earth can you know what to do and what kind of hot water it might land you in does that mean you don't act I don't know. I really don't. Mm. It's difficult, isn't it? It's difficult, it's difficult situation. Well, difficult to, uh, especially under pressure, to know what is the right thing to do and what's not. And I think, I think, I think the only two ways you can sort of plan for that and try and ensure that the risk of making a bad decision is minimal is that uh, is one is that you can try and make sure as much as you can you understand what is right and what is wrong. <laughs> which is sometimes really really hard yeah and the other one is uh is uh training for those situations i think like you know yeah for sure um anyway right what was your involvement with tv and film before you became the owner of mfs Cutting? so i'd worked with um the the two previous owners andy buckley and ben hartley um uh, andy buckley is ex bootneck and Ben is, um, or, or was, a uh, Merlin helicopter pilot on HMS Westminster. And they had set up MFS Casting. Well, it was originally MFS, uh, Military Film Services, uh, I think 2011. Um, and I'd worked with them as a supporting artist on a number of gigs. Uh, War Machine, Brad Pitt, um, uh, Spider-Man, Far From Home, wh whatever. You know, and, and so I was getting into the industry and... and, and had just been like everybody else who worked for my first casting as supporting uh, artists turn up on time square your own stuff away uh you know just do your job turn up on time just be good be professional that kind of thing uh and so all the gigs i'd, I'd worked on um gained a reputation for just being reliable um now uh, my my uh, home regiment, uh, the Honourable Artillery Company. I was uh, offered a gig on a Phase One training um, PID, so was offered either uh, NBC or CBRN, as it's now known, um, as an instructor or indeed drill instructor. So I said, <laughs> "Don't have to think twice about that one. Drill, please." So I get whisked off to Catterick on a all arms drill instructor uh, Part One course. Yeah. Um, I did that two-week course um, and then came back from that. Uh, certainly was not star student at all, but passed. Um, but then on my emails came a, a request for availability saying, is anyone a drill instructor on MFS's books? I was like literally just back off the coach. Uh, he said, right, wait one. There may be a gig for you in the following, in, in, after, the, after Christmas, New Year. So that was november december 2018 i was like fine um thought nothing more of it until christmas comes and goes new year comes and goes um i then messaged ben back go what was that gig you were 
mentioning about drill instructor. He says, okay, yeah, yeah, bear with me. Uh, comes back. Okay. You need to be at long cross studios, uh, which on the M3, um, because there's going to be uh, an event where you're training uh, a number of people to march first world war drill. Um, so I want to make sure that you can, you know, do any remedial action, make sure people don't tick tock, solve those problems, etc., etc. Uh, fine. Great. Um, so I turn up big market at Long Cross, which, uh, I didn't know at the time was a, a secret ex military, uh, armor research place. Didn't know that. I That's know. where they developed Chobham armor and, 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 uh, do you know the, the, if you remember from, you no, know, Casino Royale, the scene where, uh, Bond is chasing after, um, his, his girlfriend whose name was, anyway uh, play, plays by Vespa, Vespa. Vespa. yes yeah. right so played by Eva Green so he's chasing her and he has to swerve and and tumbles Rolls the car yeah tumbles the uh, the Aston Martin that was at Long Cross so on the other side of Long Cross there's this test track which is where they used to drive armour uh, around 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 anyway so I turn up to this place and um, this scene was for about 300 essays so lots and lots of people are coming through over the a course of maybe two weeks, a number of them at each time. So I get my pace stick out because I'm getting fully into character on this <laughs> uh, and just say, okay, and uh, there are a mix. I had uh, guard sergeant majors through to 18, 19 year old, or even sometimes um, 16 year old uh, cadets who are on like a cadet school program coming through. Okay. Who knows how to march? teach very very basic drill no no bend and drive it's all first world war stuff um and oh, we, what was the, so what was the difference then uh so uh in first world war there's no bend and drive you slid the foot in. slid the foot in oh. so just like navy why did they change it then? <sighs> good question from memory there was a uh uh discontinuity which i think the guards in between the first and second world war the guards took on this whole bend and drive thing whether it's a smartness. I mean, someone I'm sure out there will correct me as to exactly what the true story was. Uh, I don't strictly know, but as far as I know, there was a, um, a continuity and they decided, right, the whole of the army will now do this for smartness. Okay, great. Um, it certainly adds punch to the ceremony. Oh, it certainly so. adds punch. Oh, it? Imagine so. the, the, the no sound of slamming the foot. Yeah. yeah. When you come to attention. Yeah. Mm, interesting. Sorry, and also when you come on. into the halt, again, you know, come into the halt to, to do that, yeah. that crack at the end yeah. is, is, is quite, anyway. Um, <laughs> so like it turns out, I, I, I don't know uh, at this moment while I'm seeing all these people come through, I don't know what the production is. I've not been told. I'm trying to find out, but I've not been told. I've only got a, a, a code name and most movies when they're in, in that early, early stage are just done by, by code names. Um, uh, Couple of months. Ah. Your cup there. I'll pour your coffee. Thanks. Is it finished? Uh, no, just the top up, please. Um, in the preceding year, I'd always said that it would be an absolute dream to work on the Kingsman franchise, and lo and behold, <laughs> this is what it was. Thank you. Um, so it was the latest edition, so the prequel story of the Kingsman franchise, uh, King's Man, which is. Uh, um, Ray Fiennes, etc., Gemma Arterton, Harrison, um, and Jimon uh, Yunsu, who was the, the, the dude from Gladiator. Not yet, not yet. Anyway, great cast. Um, so this scene was for a march pass at Sandhurst Old College, 300 guys on parade, and here's me, literally green behind the ears, fresh out of Catrick drill, drill School, um, and here am I now promoted at the time then to be the on-screen drill instructor <laughs> for this for this <laughs> scene um and i yeah i find myself on shoot day pinching myself i'm stood in front of old college in period costume probably artistic license my pay stick under my arm giving the words of command uh that morning uh I, or that 
the preceding night I'd bought a bottle of port and gave a tot of uh, port to all my NCOs who I'd clearly seen come through on costume fitting day. Right, yeah, you clearly know more than I do. Give Saint costume, give him rank, give him rank, etc. So I then built a training team around myself, people who are probably far more qualified than I was anyway. Um, so on, on shoot day, uh, away we went. And it was epic. Again, it was like, pinch me. I can't believe this is happening. I could not believe it. They invited me back uh, to be the military advisor for the rest of the production, which I didn't take too long to think about. Amazing. Um, and it all, all went swimmingly. I loved it. I was then invited back to do uh, a post, uh, or at least secondary uh, amount of filming for a bayonet training scene. So did a bit more research on that. So there was a, a, a training team at the time led by a major going across to the Western Front and training people on the art of bayonet fighting. And what we now learn in depot or, or you know, phase one training hasn't changed very much. All that, uh, going through the the, uh, the literature, all of that screaming, what uh, what makes the grass glow, go, grass grow, blood, 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 what are you here to do? All of that was being instilled back in 1916, 1917 and, and beyond not a great deal has changed so i remember doing uh the, the training day for that event for that additional photography we had a stunt coordinator john street who's ex bootneck great guy um so he were, he and i were working together and as one of my essays from mfs he was also a phase one instructor at per right so i was like right you are the subject matter expert on Perfect. this yeah. um the, the brief to, to all the extras this is not the army um, my job today is to get you to hate my guts, to get you really quite cross, because I want that to translate to camera on shoot day. So we took them through a very, very basic um, you know, leopard crawling, up, run, sprint, down, leopard crawling, just lots and lots and lots of that. Um, and then when it came to shoot day, when the, the, the key words were being issued, um, we then set up the, um, the scaffold with the sandbag so that when they had to lunge, they meant it, and it came across on camera, so I was quite chuffed with that. Um, give me goosebumps even thinking about it now. <laughs> it translated really well, really yeah. well. So, um, yeah, I can't quite believe it. it sounds incredible. Yeah, it's, uh, it's um, that, the bayonet training, my God, that was one of the most miserable days I remember in mm -hmm. Depot. One of the most miserable fucking days. That was horrendous for a bunch of different reasons. My God. Was it parry, thrust? What's the... What's the uh, thrust, the three, three on, well, there was the on guard. Oh God, yeah. Okay, and and high port, and we went through those a lot. Do you remember those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was in the in the actual act of bayoneting, it was parry, thrust, and the block maybe thrust. No, something else. Parry, maybe parry. Anyway, I can't remember. People no, I don't, I don't remember. remember. Yeah. Well, people are knowing, listen to this, knowing and thinking, shouting at this. Yes, it was, it was this. Yeah. Well, forgive me. It was twenty three yeah. years ago now. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, my God, my God. So, um, so having worked with essays before MFS, mm -hmm. you must have realised what a mad bunch they can be. You get all sorts, and I'm speaking from my own personal experience as an SA. <laughs> so I know, I know. There are some crackers people who turn up to be yeah. extras on set, aren't yeah. there? Mm -hmm. There are some people who just turn up because they're retired. They've got nothing else to do. They let you come along. They'll bring a book. They'll sit there reading between shoots. Then they'll go and do whatever. They're just quite happy, content. And it's a bit of money as well. A bit mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. Something a bit different. And there's other people who are there because they think it's going to make them a big name on a big production somewhere. Isn't there? They are fucking mad. Colourful people. Must be colourful worse on military productions. Ah, there are some, some interesting people. And you know, <laughs> I, guess, I guess that the experience that we've had is that when we've had individuals like those who are like, oh, my Lord, you know, uh, whether it's back chatting to the ADs or like, come here, come here. Mm -mm. Behave. Um, we, we can... Your, your enthusiasm is valued. And so we're talking to them in a, in a very different way that we might talk to someone in uniform. Um, they may have been in uniform and generally people who have got actual service experience are generally far safer pairs of hands. <laughs> um, but there are people who do turn up and, you know, uh, claim 
all sorts. Uh, and of course, there's you know, there's there's that that the oh yeah, sure, whatever um, that comes in. And the contribution, of course, is value, but it just has to be focused. So my job now as leader of that outfit is, you know. No one's here to, to uh, do any uh, Walt hunting or anything like that. If if we can help focus someone's enthusiasm for everyone's benefit, I have to be very politically correct these days and go, that's fine. These are the boundaries. This is how we're going to, to work. Is that okay? Great. Um, so, um, yes. It is, I, it is something I would do regularly. If I had the time, the extra time, and my life wasn't as hectic as it is right now, I would do it as just literally for the crack and for the extra beer tokens. I would because for the most part, my experience has been I've enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I was, I've been pretty lucky on what I worked on in terms of the way the culture, you know, off camera, it was just welcoming and it was cool and yeah. everyone from the director down were pretty fucking chilled. Yeah. Um, so I'm based on that experience. I would do it. I would do it regularly because it's interesting. You meet such fascinating people. Yeah. And I'm on about the celebs. I'm on about the, the people, extras. The actual people. <laughs> just fascinating people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you get to learn about how it all works, the production. Yeah, yeah. It's so fun. And one of the things that struck me when I started doing it a couple of years ago was the technology. Wow. Wow. Especially like the technology you find uh, when they're shooting like on, on location. Because they haven't got the luxury of a, of a, of a, you know, of a studio, where everything's wired and ev- all the technology's there embedded. They have to bring it somewhere. Like the, the wireless tech, the Wi-Fi tech between the cameras and the sound equipment. And that Focus sounds, pull it sounds really basic. Yeah, and no. Wi-Fi tech. No, you should see the shit. Yeah. You should see the technology on these sets and the, the people who, like the cameramen, the sound, sound people, cars, everyone. Everything. They have got brains the size of planets. It really is an art. It yeah, really is yeah. an art. Yeah. And then you look at the the whip crackers and the and the the, the management aspect, the ads, the producers. For them to bring it all together, it literally it's it's a different beast. It's a different. It's a, such a a unique industry. That people don't really realize because it. It, it seems so normal. Mm-hmm. People think they know it to a certain extent because they watch it on TV. We haven't got a clue. You ever get a chance, I think, you know, if anyone ever gets a chance to get on set, either to be a studio or anything, even just to be an onlooker, 100% do it. It's it's amazing. Yes, I am. Shameless plug, (laughs) mfscasting.co.uk. There's four streams. There's four streams. If you're military, go through the military. If you're police or have SPAC training, go that way. If you're medical, that's one thing we've opened up. So we've got medical, both military and just... (laughs) I say just NHS, whether you've got military uh, or, or not experience as a medic, doctor, nurse, sister, you name it, don't care. We want you. Uh, people like Holby City, casualty, jobs like that. We want people who know what they're doing. And then we've got a, a stream for everyone else. So indeed, we can do mass crowds for features, like hundreds of people uh, playing normal everyday people through to people with very very special skills so that's kind of where i'm focusing the mfs brand now is yes military yes police yes doctors nurses emergency services got pilots fixed wing and rotary so i'm just gathering it all together if you've got special skills or not but special skills is kind of the bit that i can now say to an ad or a producer if you want people who can do this we're, we're your guys so um Ben and um, uh, and another friend of his were teaching uh, cast how to fly the Millennium Falcon because they're helicopter pilots. So they would then be subject matter experts on set. Stop, 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 stop. We need to roll that sentence back. <laughs> they were teaching cast. cast how to fly the Millennium Falcon, Falcon. because they're helicopter pilots. Love it. <laughs> um, I suppose that's the nearest you're going to get to someone who would actually know how to fly the Millennium Falcon. Yeah, <laughs> Amazing. So, just all, all of those controls were, were all uh, obviously to be a rotary pilot. You have to be fixed wing qualified as well. But um, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. So, to, yeah, to qualify as a helicopter pilot, you first have to do your fixed wing. In, yeah, pl- fixed wing plane plane yeah. pilot first, yeah. helicopter pilot second. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people don't know that. So, is that the same in Civvy Street? Uh, I think I don't know is the short answer, but I presume yes. Okay. I presume yes. Um, if you're doing a PPL for a helicopter, I think they do start you off with some of the basics in terms of flight controls in, in a, in a Cessna basic plane 
Mm. Yeah. So how does it work with with uh, MFS? So Joe blogs, listens to this and says, oh, I'm interested in that because I've heard about this stuff elsewhere and uh, I like the sound of I like the sound of um, Freddy. So what? Have you got a? They can just sign up on the website. So, so they go to mfscasting.co.uk uh, and go to register. Have a good read of the blurb. So the, the the blurb is like this is this is the deal, you know, um, and that you're expected to be timely, organised. This is how pay works, all that stuff. Have a good read, inwardly digest, and take note of all of that stuff that's clearly there as to the about and and what what and how the whole deal works. And if all of that is to your uh, agreement then indeed you go to the register and uh, as i said earlier there's four streams uh general for pretty much anybody um then you've got the medic then you've got spacs and police so spacs and police both have weapons training but may not have worn a military uniform um they will have had specific weapons training from the likes of uh, bags and other organizations who do military uh, weapons training for actors that is their uh, one of their primary uh, you del- know about delivery i do oh cool and um i like that i like that and then there's the military side which of course is army navy air force and uh anyone who's got service on that and when you go through the application form it will ask you for you know if you've got a service number stick it down uh, any of your trades, any of your specific bits and pieces, let it all know because then it means I can then search for it. So if an AD says to me, I need 30 guys who are firearms trained to be police in a movie, I can go fine. I can go through all my SO19 guys. I can go through all my uh, military army guys and, and pick out who's available because of the, of the skill sets that you can bring to, to the party, for want of a better word. Um, and then put, put people like that forward to, to, uh, to the AD and away we go. If you're a drill instructor, you know, all of these things, there's space for much that you can do in the military. Uh, whether you're an aircraft mechanic, whether you're a pilot, you name it, it's all there to be captured and just helps my search and selection to then put that specialist skill forward so much easier. Mm-hmm. Um, then once you're registered, I then approve uh, registrations. I do that normally once a week. Um, otherwise, I'm there every day. And uh, then when gigs start to come through, an AD will say, I need, I've got a brief. Here's the feature um, for the following scenes. I then send out an availability request uh, based on costume. Costume normally get there first and say, we've got X costumes um, from sizes of very, very small to not quite so small. I then have to go and find the people who fit those costumes. That's generally how it goes in practical terms in real life. Ideally, um, we get to choose before costume get their hands on it. So I can then say to an AD, these are all the people with the, with the skill sets you've said. Have a look through those, choose who you want, and then costume um, normally get their hands on it. Uh, and ideally, the people will, will drive costume. That's rare. But So it happens the other way around normally. Costume yeah. drive the people. Yeah. Really? Yes. Because costumes are really hard to get hold of. Sometimes they have to get made uh, in in Poland. Uh, and so, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, an air vice marshal, and when there's one or two people in the country who might have passed on their uniform to that costume, we've got hold of it. So they might have a greater range of, of some of these uniforms, like a dress, uh, uh, you know, number twos. Um, not everyone has managed to get a hold of uh, a number twos. So a, a costume maker, uh, like in, in Poland, will do a run of tens, maybe hundreds of, of costumes for period. So costume will normally say, this is what we've got available. So the people that you can bring to the party have to fit these costumes. So I then have to do my searches within my resource of firearms people or weapons trained people. Okay, are you a five foot four? for example, up to a six foot six um, and a waist of 31 to maybe 34. And that suddenly reduces my resource uh, down to makes sense. 20, if I'm lucky. Ah, it is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. We accommodate it. So what how, what led you to what led you to uh, join the HAC anyway? How did what, you get... Okay. Like, where, where's the military connection come from? Uh, military connection. So... Um, I had been 
one of those OTC cadets, Officer Training Corps at university. Um, my army number is is now quite old. I'm two four nine seven two six three six. That dates me to 1996. Two four nine. Two four nine. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I did three years with those guys at Aberystwyth and and Cardiff, and then with your Wales rubber shirt on. <laughs> um, and then was looking for a good unit to join. Uh, after I came down to London, and then I was recommended to the HAC because of, of the job they do. Are you right? I'm me? good, thank you. Okay. Um, recommended to join the HAC because um, of the jobs they did, and uh, joined cool. them in 2002. And I've had a kit career. You know, it's been a pastime, something I really loved, but it's always had to play second fiddle to career. So HAC is where you are with. Janie, right? That's where Janie I met Miguel, Miguel, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, So I, I joined them 2002 to about 2007 and then had some time out. Rejoined in 2012, maybe. Um, and now I'm on the reserve reinforcement group, so I'm a paper soldier now. But my, my home is back at Army House. I love it. Love the people. Your home back at where? Army House. So the, the headquarters of the HAC. Uh, That's called Army House. Army House. On yeah. City Road. Yes. Oh, right. My uh, my day job office is two hundred meters up the road. No way. Not even not even two hundred meters. Yeah. In Marsat. In Marsat. Yeah. There we go. That's my day job. Oh well, via sat now. Okay. Walk, but yeah. uh, and you were of course involved in the missing uh, MH370 in Marsat hugely. I wasn't personally you, before right, my but time. The company. But yeah, they, they were. Yeah, they were involved in that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, they were leading the leading, leading the, sat, the satellite search for it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, interesting place. In- in- it is an interesting place, actually. The, the guy who, um, the guy, one of the senior managers of the network operations center is, is an ex, oh, I can't say it on it, actually. <laughs> I can't say it on it. He's ex military. Right. And from a, an interesting branch of the military. Just Which everyone else will, of course, fill in to be exactly <laughs> what it, what it needs to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is a cool place to work. Anyway, I digress. Army House. I didn't know it was called Army House. Yeah. 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 So, uh, right, Army cool. House and, well, Army House is the, is the big period building behind Finsbury Barracks. Finsbury Barracks is the bit that, that kind of joins on as adjacent to, to um, City Road. Yeah. If you go through those gates, if you get past security, good luck. Um, and then uh, then Army House is this beautiful period building that overlooks the, the, the playing fields. Oh, that's the, the oh, okay, that's the main building there on the that's right the, where all the offices are, right? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, right. So, what's the oh, where's the where's the Arnhem connection then? Because I know you're so, keen. I know okay. you're mad, keen, mad yeah. keen on Arnhem. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Kane, Kane VC. Yeah, that's right, Mid-Kane on the VC. icebreaker. Yeah. So my Arnhem connection is my maternal grandfather, who at the time was Lieutenant Rod Pearson was their survey officer for the 1st Air Landing Light Regiment Royal Artillery. Had survived, prior to Arnhem, had survived the, the Roman Candle, which I was telling you about in the car, which is, for those who don't know, Roman Candle is when you jump out of a, a plane and your silk parachute does not open properly. So you come plummeting to earth with this rather useless trail of fabric flapping above your head, not opening and not and not slowing down your descent until the ground does. So he managed to survive that when they were doing parachute trials up at Ringway in Manchester. I don't know what year. Um, uh, obviously his internal organs have moved around a bit, but uh, he was he was then posted to uh, first air landing as a survey officer. Um, which, of course, in the days pre-GPS and all of that sort of stuff, a gun would have to be surveyed onto the ground with theolodites so that when you know a gun was placed, the command post and the OP knows where the guns are relative to where the target is so that when they do bearing and elevation, they know actually you know within a degree of error that rounds will land close enough that you can then walk, walk the full shot on. So um, that was his job. So in 1944, he'd done a bit of Africa. Oh, yeah. Uh, an interesting prologue to this is that he had been uh, taken down with amoebic dysentery in Africa. Amoebic dysentery. Amoebic okay. dysentery. Yep. Not nice. No. Um, Sounds bacterial. It, it was horrendous, apparently. Uh, and if you Wikipedia it or Google it or do whatever else you want to do with it, amoebic dysentery is very unpleasant. Um, and was, was, um, 
confined to a hospital ship as a result of this said infection. Rumour has it, and I haven't yet verified it, so take it with a big pinch of salt, but rumour has it that uh, as he heard that his unit was now leaving Africa to make their way back to Blighty in advance of Market Garden, he decided to jump off the ship and swim ashore and make his way back to Blighty on his own to rejoin the unit. <laughs> Sadly, he died oh, no. of old age. Um, yeah, obviously, after after giving birth to my mum and all that sort of stuff, he obviously made it back. He obviously got to Arnhem and survived all that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Um, so there's no way of me really verifying this story. But why... I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to say, why ruin a good story by even trying to verify it's it? It's a great story. I am happy to verify it. <laughs> it's verify. I'm verifying it. 100%. 100% okay. happened. Yeah, 100%. So, uh, so I'm on board with that. Yeah. Prior to Arnhem, he'd obviously proven himself as quite an, in- an interesting character. And, you know, your, one of your uh, opening questions to me on the icebreaker was, you know, who would you like to have a beer with? If it wasn't granddad, not grandpa as we call him, uh, back then... That that would have been a good good few beers to have. Yeah, sounds like it. I'm looking at Rod Lieutenant Rod Pearson. Yeah, yeah. Pegasus Archive. Yeah, let's have let's have a quick read about Rod. Come on. Oh, and your dad's here as well. Yes, Colonel Freddy Camp will be. Yeah, a survey officer, Lieutenant Pearson. Lieutenant Pearson found himself without a meaningful role to perform at Arnhem, so he carried out a variety of tasks wherever the opportunity presented itself. He helped to establish an OP, an observation post, in the spire of Oosterbeek Church, and from here he was able to direct fire from the guns of the 64th Medium Regiment, yep. based near Nijmegen. Ny- yep. He also acted as gun position officer with B Troop and helped care for the wounded in the regiment lay post. Pearson was wounded later in the battle whilst in the vicinity of F Troop. In late 1945, he was made a uh, a member of the British Empire. I can't verify that. What MBE? Mm. Really? Yeah, I think he was. I think he was given a citation for it, but but he certainly never wore it. He certainly never used any initials. So that to me is. He served with distinction in the Italy and Arnhem campaigns. Yeah. He was recommended for an immediate de- decoration after Arnhem, which was not awarded. In both theatres, he showed great coolness, cheerfulness, and set a fine example in leadership skills and courage. Yeah. He's one of the few people to have survived a parachute drop, not in action, when the parachute failed to open. Yeah. And further, this accident has not in any way shaken his nerve or diminished his enterprise or keenness. Since Arnhem... He, this is obviously a report from soon after the war. Mm. Since Arnhem, he has maintained a high standard of work and, and of discipline. They don't make him like that anymore, do they? No. They and don't, do they? I, I do hold him as, as an example. I really do. I, mm. I look up to him, and, and you know, he was clearly made of something special. A yeah, different breed back then, I think. Different breed, for sure. I'm so proud of him. It's un- unbelievable. I mean, I'm, you know, and, uh, Dad um, as well. Um, he, was, he is something special, too. So who did your dad serve he was, was airborne, you know? he was airborne, yeah. airborne engineers. So he was second command, nine squadron Royal engineers in the Falklands in 1982. I thought I reckoned like, you know, when you, I was, when Jenny G says, I thought, I know that name. I know this guy. I know this guy from somewhere. It's it, probably your dad. It's probably, as in, I didn't know your dad, but it's the name. I thought, yeah. I've heard this name before. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. I get that a lot, as you can probably imagine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cause we're obviously namesakes. I'm the sixth or seventh consecutive Freddie Kemp informally. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's clearly a brand. It works. My son's Freddie as well. So um, long may it continue is all I can say to that. Uh, but yeah, so dad was second command, nine squadron Royal engineers in the Falklands. Um, and then left the regular army in 1991, just as uh, Iraq one was kicking off up Granby. Um had already started his his uh, um, his departure at that point. Um, then, as a reserve airborne officer, he was with ten and or four power at different points. 
Um, but eventually, uh, after a period in industry as, as a, um, uh, someone in business, he then rejoined, uh, on full time reserve service equivalent, but became a brigade asset, went to Afghanistan in 2001, soon after, um, 9 11, and, um, was then involved in, um, Telic One. Um, and became a brigade asset for, for Herrick, etc. Uh, as far as I know, he didn't talk too much about that. Um, I would have definitely brushed, brushed sure. shoulders with this guy. I'm sure. In a cookhouse somewhere or, or saluting him somewhere, either in Afghan or in, in, in Iraq 2003. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm just looking, as you're talking, I'm looking through his, his write up as well, actually. Yeah. 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 Go on, um, sorry. And then, um, posts after that, he was, uh, Defense Investigation Unit, which was one of his last major passions, um, DIU, so based down at Andover, um, and he was... Inquest Unit. Inquest yeah. Unit, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think that gave him such an amount of purpose. He loved it. Really? Yeah. Must have been quite a, like a horrific job. I'm looking at yeah, 300, was, 300, 300 plus military inquests. Yeah. And a lot to do with SF. Yeah. That is not an easy job. No. Um, and, and it had, it copped some heat, copped some, some, uh, grief for his part in one or two, um, which destroyed him, utterly destroyed him that he would even be, uh, his integrity would even be questioned. Uh, and the book was written about that. Um, and, and then, uh, was made, OBE as a result of that work, um, and then uh, was then involved in a, a, a new piece in terms of bridging the gap between army cadets and uh, regular army to bridge that that gap for the recruitment side, um, and was much more involved in the politics of that, which he wasn't so keen on. Um, so yeah, uh, and then he died. Uh, sadly succumbed to pancreatic cancer after a brave fight three years ago on the 18th of September. Not long ago. Age 66. Far too young. Oh my God. Sorry to hear that. Sorry to hear that. Again, another person who I live up to. Mm -hmm. I'm not airborne. Um, but, you know, Grandpa at Arnhem, Dad, and his dad, um, was also airborne engineers. I've got three maroon berets in my immediate lineage. Uh, so something exists in here. I'm not airborne, I, 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 but I am exactly. I'm looking at it now. Um, something in here. Yeah, I can't wear the berry. Yeah, I'm not fit enough. Never was, but still. But you, um, I, aren't you? So you're taking an active role in active role. You're doing Arnhem tours, are you not? I'm going to be delivering more and more Arnhem Roll uh, tours as a result of the connection, the maternal grandfather connection to Osterbeck and the locals and Kate to Horse and her descendants who are um, more than family friends to us now. Um, so I have a unique perspective as grandson of, fa uh, son of, and indeed the family connection to, to Osterbeck and that little village and that family and that house where legend have uh, has it, I began my life, I think. <laughs> um so that house has a real meaning to my family but certainly to to me um and the connection that we have to that family and that's that whole story um is something else so as a result pulling together all these bits of evidence anecdotal evidence uh from all the work that's gone before um and, and creating it so it's a story i can then tell from my perspective not wearing a maroon beret, but from that perspective, this is my grandfather, this is my dad, who mm. used to run those tours for um, many, many um, battalions who were on a, a jump for the Arnhem weekend. Uh, he would have done a, a tour, no doubt, up at Wolf Hazer or the landing zones or up at the bridge. Um, it's now, you know, that's my job now. Mm. I've done a couple of tours out there, as in guided tours, and the the, definitely the best ones are where they're taken by someone who's literally got an actual personal connection to someone who is actually there. Yeah. It makes a huge difference in, in when you listen to the information from the person. Yeah. They got the, you know, they got all the 
the factual based stuff you can find online about what went on, but then when you hear the little personal stories, which are only a, like a generation or two away, so they, they're real accurate. You know, it hasn't been, it's like, it's not a thousand year old story, which has sort of been Chinese whispered out of it. These are like real, actual little anecdotes that happen. Mm. It makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference. I really, I really, uh, I really enjoy those ones. Um, did you get out there this year? I didn't, not this year. No. Um, I was out You must in, be doing next year if the 80th. I am. Yeah. Oh, eight years, not eight years. Eight 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 years. Eight years. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I'm expecting, I can't mention any names or units at the moment, but I'm expecting to be able to, to deliver tours to s- serving people, whether it's a, a formal or in, uh, informal um, as a civvies arrangement. Uh, but I'm hoping to do many more of those. Uh, as a supplementary side to to the film side, again, it's 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 key. There, there's not many veterans still left alive. It's a clearly an important year, um, and with that connection, it would be a shame to not keep that story alive, if only to to remind people of the bravery, indeed, that we've already discussed. That they don't make them like that anymore. There were so many acts of extreme bravery and courage under intensely horrific circumstances which again bridge too far only touches the surface when you start reading all this this other stuff going back to again one of the questions you were asking me on the icebreaker what am i reading at the moment looking at the german perspective what the ss panzer divisions the ninth and tenth um ss panzer were, were doing in the days preceding and how they responded to the fact that there was this huge air landing uh happening um it it uh you know, a bridge too far. Cornelius Ryan's book and the film that was made just about touches the surface. There's so much more, and Osterbeck, I think, warrants its own story. It, it warrants its movie on its own, on its own merit. Um, Graham Warwick, who was a medical uh, officer, um, up at so I don't know from your own trips down to uh, Osterbeck in the town, not far from the Hartenstein Hotel, which was Urquhart's headquarters. There's a crossroads. On the Utrecht uh, Weg and down into um, Osterbeck village, heading down towards the river, there's a, a place called Schoenord Hotel. And uh, back in the day, that was indeed a hotel. And a little bit further, maybe what, 250 odd meters a bit further towards the river, there's a place called the Tafelberg Hotel. Schoenord was a, a dressing station um, and was taken over or occupied by uh, for British First Airborne guys. Um, but the locals, um, a family called the Van der Vlist family owned the hotel, so indeed they they allowed the hotel to be used as dressing and and first aid. Medical orderlies uh, were carrying injured blokes from there under fire with their fur- Red Cross armbands on, with their hobnail boots up a cobbled road down to this uh, hotel called Tafelberg, which is where all the operations were having. Now. Graham, Graham Warwick's book, he was the, the medical um, officer and one of the surgeons, um, was telling how uh, this, um, the schoonhold was changing hands so many times in the latter stages of the battle. So, you know, and it could happen multiple times a night. Fire, you know, sniper fire rounds are coming in to the schoonhold hotel, taking out orderlies, taking out people who are lying on stretchers, so they put everyone on the floor. The, just the cauldron, I think the German called it the witch's cauldron, the fighting around that crossroads in the latter stages of, of the Arnhem battle, um, way after the bridge had kind of been lost and that part of the main effort had been, um, uh, that the focus now was now, now on this, this crossroads. Uh, and Graham Warwick, the medical officer, didn't get across the river on the main evacuation. He was then evading capture until don't quote me on this. He was evading capture, working through the Dutch resistance, I think at least until the January of 1945. <laughs> so he hadn't made it across on the main evacuation. All the following two attempts at evacuation was now evading capture with the Dutch underground until at least December, if not January 1945, before he got back to Plyty. Amazing book. It's called Travel After Dark by Graham Warwick. Travel After Dark. After the Amazing book. Travel After Dark. And I, I think I'm only halfway through it. Oh. It's one of those. I mean, my reading list is long as my arm. Um, yeah, mate, we, you've got a train to catch. We, we've got, oh we've, got a, we've got a hard stop. Um, 
Been great chatting. Been great Thank chatting. Shame we haven't got longer, but it is what it is. Uh, how did people? So M- mfscasting.co.uk. Yeah. And uh, what about the Arnhem stuff? Um, come through MFS Casting for that to, to start with. Um, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Um, I'm about to do website launches and all that sort of stuff, Patreon. So uh, come through MFS Casting for all of that to start with. Unless, of course, you are one of the privileged few to have my direct number, and then uh, you know, crack on. <laughs> you're going to make me delete it after this aren't you uh, no. <laughs> no you're okay Be good. thank good you l- so good much luck. good luck with it good luck with it thank Sounds you good. Much and um, if we get the opportunity to do it again we should do it again I'd love to right. thanks <laughs>